I've been at Ridgedale Permaculture for about a week now and we're just at the tail end of a four-day workshop that I'm doing with Richard Perkins and for those of you who don't know Richard Perkins you should know who Richard Perkins is he wrote a book called making small farms work and he's demonstrating five or six I think six different types of regenerative agriculture systems here raising uh, a variety of different types of animals he has a market garden and they're trying all kinds of stuff and it's a really cool farm because there's a lot to see here and it's kind of like a testing ground as well as an educational dis demonstration farm but as well as a production farm the farm makes money and so today I'm actually gonna sit down with Richard and there's been some questions that you guys have asked me to ask him so I'm gonna pose some of those to him but we're also just gonna have a conversation about some sort of broader subjects within this space and things that we uh, are, are seeing and some trends that are happening so let's get into it Richard we just finished while well, we're just finishing our our four-day workshop before that we did one in Stockholm and uh, we've got people from all over Europe here yeah. well kind of I mean we've got the, some people from Italy lots of Luxembourg Germany, yeah, yeah. Luxembourg, Germany. Norway the UK it's some Australia from Americans uh, that's right quite Australia, a few Americans yeah quite surprising Hawaii. Hawaii that's right yeah pretty cool how do you it's think been it's going? Great, no? yeah, yeah, I think it's been fantastic. I think there's been a great synergy between our approaches. We're both passionate about getting people started, and our farms are very different, obviously, and our, our contexts are different. But it's what excited me about the whole thing is the, you know, from micro urban all the way through to, you know, larger rural farms, there's possibilities, and we have solutions to make enterprises work so it's really great to see so many passionate people come out and be able to take them through like the nuts and bolts of what's going on in our operations and our approach to business and entrepreneurialism too which is I think people have got a lot of value for money absolutely mm. absolutely I, I, I one thing I've enjoyed too is just seeing I think I think from I kind of looking at it through a student's perspective in that when they're here they're seeing all these enterprises in quite a bit of detail yeah you know, on your farm alone, you've got, what is it, five different types of production in the sense that you've got a market garden, you've got some cattle, yeah. you've, you've got broilers, you've got egg layers, turkeys, you've got turkeys, you've got pigs. pigs. So it's, it's still scaling up, like the, the cows have, or we used to have 50 sheep last year for homesteading, for meat supply, and we're making about 10,000 meals on the farm each year, so providing our own food is a lot more than just the family's food mm -hmm. but uh, the cows are now turning into a production slowly it's a multi-year thing as we right. start to breed beef animals onto this old heirloom Swedish breed and we have agroforestry systems that are a long-term thing that are going to take over one day but these are all things that don't cash flow quickly so we've really focused on scalable enterprises that can be started up with 20,000 euros on rented land and, and we're really focused on exposing people to, hey, you know, here's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Which bits fit your context? What, what land base have you got? What resources have you got? What skills do you have? What do you want your data to look like? And getting people familiar. And it's been really interesting to get feedback from people who have come, watched all of our videos, read our books. And there's been a few people giving feedback that just to, like, have your hands in, the, in that and to smell it, to see it, gives such a different sense. Absolutely. And it makes things click for people, which, yeah, I think is really, it's powerful. You should always definitely go out and see places that inspire you to get really in touch with it and get your hands involved and your senses engaged. It's a different thing than just book learning or online yeah. learning, etc. Exactly. So as a farmer, as, as a person running this operation, when you started it, because how many years has Ridgedale been? This is our fifth season. It's our fifth season on this online. But you've been into this stuff for quite a while. Yeah, I went to ag school at 18 and did organic crop production. So I came into all of this through vegetable production, field scale, CSAs and things I used to run in the UK. And I actually went full cycle and left all the veg production mm -hmm. and just found it grinding, not well paid and... I wanted to look for better things and I wanted, I've always been interested in animal based systems and perennial plant based systems so I went on a big old trip and I've just come back round to the market garden. That's not something we plan to turn into an enterprise here. Yeah and so that's kind of where, what I want to ask is that 
you were talking before about what systems that are cash flowing into these longer term systems. The longer term systems are obviously things like the cattle, the agroforestry. Mm -hmm. Those things to have a longer return on investment. Out of all the enterprises that you have here, or things that you know of, what are the ones that cash flow the fast, the fastest? I'd say like they're fairly similar, but they look different in their investment and day-to-day -day running. So by far the the best cash flowing enterprise I've come across is things like pastured meat birds, broilers. This is something you can scale up and down within the season instantly and start up at low cost. We put 20,000 euros into a startup. That's including building a slaughtery. So we have an on-farm slaughter facility and that means we get the revenue out of the birds. Like we're not handing anything off. We're going from chick to field pen to slaughter to packaged product. And that's an enterprise kicking out, you know, 100,000 euros a year. So it's easily capable of paying off its debts and creating profit in the first year. Now, we didn't start at the scale we're producing now, but we're actually producing less than we used to do. And we're smoking birds, which doubles the revenue. So we built a low cost smoker this year. And so that's a way of us increasing revenue without actually doing more birds and giving us diverse work, which is working out really well. It's still in the early stages of that. Things like pastured turkeys is even more profitable, but that's, there's no market for it here in Sweden. Where I come from in the UK, it's a, a much bigger, you know, Christmas uh, turkeys is a big thing, whereas here people eat ham and it's turkeys not so much in the culture. <laughs> right. But layers less profitable. And I would say like the way we've scaled it, it that all of our main enterprises are producing similar revenue, the market gardens, the layers and the boilers. But what you see is that they require different time inputs and different resource inputs. So the gardens take by far the, the greatest labor, but they also have four months off in the winter. So it's very different to like the egg layers, which generate the same revenue with about a third of the work. But then it's year round, every day, seven days a week, you don't get a day off. And you need a couple of hectares of land. So, you know, it's part of my role has been marrying people to their land base. And like, hey, you've got five hectares and you've got this desire to earn this much money. These are the sort of things you can do. And these things need more land and these things you don't need that space for. So what fits your, your land base? And the boilers, again, that's something that's very concentrated into the summer. It's six months only. And so that one is capable of generating a family income on a couple of hectares, but six months on, six months off. And so you've got to then decide what your day looks like. These yeah. are the, both the pasture poultry enterprises are part time hours uh, to produce the, the same revenue. And it's basically down to like I like a diverse working day. So I like to have a little of everything rather than just focusing in on one thing. And that yeah. brings a bit of resilience too. Like in this drought year, the gardens are not performing how they you were planned to. But we're okay because we can just allocate more birds for smoking and put some emphasis on that to get the revenue back. And so why, I mean, I think I know the answer because it seems somewhat self-evident because I've seen the enterprises. But is it that the egg layers are not quite as profitable as the broilers because you've got the bird, the, the, the egg mobiles, which are bigger infrastructure, and they also require more constant work, might require a bit more inputs in the winter, opposed to the broilers. The broiler, like the broiler hens, are, the pens are quite simple, yeah. stripped down, and they're just like focused because it's like grow the bird and then kill it. It's, it's not that simple. I mean, eggs are a sticky point. So where I come from in the UK, eggs are very low priced. And I think all eggs are underpriced. I mean, it's a very cheap source of protein when you think about it compared to animal proteins. And here we get a decent, we peg our eggs with organic prices in the supermarket. We're not certified organic, but we feed only organic certified feed. Uh, but eggs is so sensitive, but it's a perfect gateway product. People buy your eggs, and they, if you have really good pastured eggs and no one else does, then they're always going to come back buy your eggs. And that means you can easily tag on a turkey, a smoked chicken, a vegetable box, or whatever. So it's a, a brilliant gateway enterprise. It's very profitable still. I mean, it's, it's definitely a great enterprise to run, but the ecosystem services are far greater than with the boilers. Now we've radically transformed our pastures here and I think it's mostly down to the pastured layers. Because of the scarifying action and their constant work on the ground. And that's why I've ended up, I never even ate chicken until I was like in my 20s. What? And Why is that? Well I just never 
I've never been exposed to chicken. I had no interest to be a chicken farmer. It just turns out that for small farms, things like poultry are far more profitable than larger animal uh, enterprises. But also they have far more impact on the land. So if we're trying to build soil, build our pastures, fertility back, then they can have far more impact than any larger animals like ruminants. Hmm. But I think comparing broilers and layers, for me they're, they're similar in the sense that whilst the daily workload looks different, um, I think the profitability of the layers can't just be measured financially. Like their services on the land are worth it sure. even if it was less profitable. Right. And so I'm, I'm really a big fan of layers. It's one of my favorite enterprises. And if it's done right, it's, it's really profitable. I mean, we're producing 30 tons of eggs here on three hectares. And, you're, and you have to go get them a few times a day, don't you? Twice a day. Twice a day, okay. Yeah. So quite a, we're in a very short growing season, three months without frost, and that can vary a month either way. So it can be a couple of months without frost on an extreme year. So in the summer, it's moving eggmobiles. We leave them two days in one place move two of them we have three right now so we move two one day one the next like so and we're picking eggs after breakfast and then at 3 30 when we close them up so it's a two hours a day enterprise and that's to pack a thousand eggs as well so it's pretty swift but it is seven days a week there's no day off from that and then in the winter it's quite different the birds are indoors so they're asleep at four o'clock so right now we go at 11 30 at night to close the hens up in the middle of the summer so someone's got to be awake for that. Now, you could obviously automate that kind of thing or whatever. But in the winter, it's the opposite. So birds are asleep at 4 o'clock in the evening. And you have to go pick eggs three times rather than two because it's minus 30 and they're freezing. So it's quite a different thing. And it's a very light-sensitive enterprise. And it's like everything here. It's observational-based. Well, that's what I thought was interesting when I went and watched you and Toby do the layers yesterday you're talking about because you know we're in the northern hemisphere similar to where I am in Canada mm -hmm. you're a bit further north but how you have to adjust when you move them based on the light cycles and after the summer solstice your days are diminishing quite exponentially and so in a month you're going to be move you said you're, you're going to be moving them at 9 a.m. opposed to right now you're moving them at about 10 no, to no. 10 to 6 or something like we're that. We're going to be closing them up at 9 at 9 p.m. So we'll always move them. Like the way we run our farm is we like to get all the main chores done before breakfast. Now, moving cows after two o'clock is better for the cows. People get two kilo milk increase just by moving animals after photosynthetic peak in the day. But we don't, you know, there's lots of things we could do differently. But for practical reasons, we just move everything before breakfast. Okay, so we're okay. all awake. We're all checked in. We know everything's good. And it's just a simple, practical way to run the farm. But the times will change and the birds will get less frantic to get out. It's a bit of a time pressure in the summer. It's just where automation of opening and closing could help, but we're always up anyway and out and about. So so you're, you, you'll be doing that when it's dark in the fall yep. then too? Okay. Totally. Okay, like, okay. I thought it was a, a light thing that it had to be done because the chickens didn't want to come out until a certain time. No, with the light. so later in, in August when, you know, September, you'll come and open them up and they're not in any hurry to get out whereas right now the sun is coming up four o'clock in the morning so they're ready to come out at six o'clock when you wake up and so we're just trying to open them the latest we can that we get some good sleep too but this is how farming is in this latitude we have really long daylight hours in the summer it doesn't really go dark it goes dusky for a few hours and then it's the total opposite in winter it's not light till 9 30 quarter to 10 and then dark pitch black again at four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, that's the northern climate we live in. Okay, I want to ask uh, one more question and then, then I want to just pitch to you some of the questions that my uh, YouTube sure. subscribers asked. Um, so one thing I observed, and I could be wrong, and tell me if, if this is um, the case, but it seems like that out of the enterprises that you run, the, the market garden, the pigs, the chickens, the broilers, the egg layers, the, uh, what's the other one? The pigs? Turkeys. Turkeys. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that the vegetable garden is a little less nuanced in that it seems like you have been able to delegate better to things in the market garden than you have the animals. Because when I've been watching you, even with your crew, with the animals, it seems like your expertise and your knowledge of the little micro decisions that have to be made on which way to move a certain thing, like with the layers the other day, 
that's been more difficult for you to back away from because it's it's slightly more nuanced. Would you say that that's sort of a a crack, correct observation? Whereas I haven't seen you work in the garden here. No, I actually intended. You, you've been to... able to delegate that quite well, but the animals are a little. Seems like they're a little harder to scale because your expertise is so needed in there. Well, it's it's difficult to. I mean, I could answer that in many different ways. I think, it, and it would depend on the season. We every year we've been here, we've faced extreme conditions: driest summer, wettest summer, coldest spring. Now, the driest years since 1950. So it's it's challenging, and I think a lot of people coming here are not used to being at such high latitude. And for example, coming to the gardens this year like water's been an issue, it's just dry, but actually nearly every year is so wet that it, the wetness is the problem. So someone coming here will start to think uh, we need solutions for this thing, but actually in the longer term we need solutions for this opposite thing. And so I need to sort of balance the expectations or, or desires of a team who are only seeing a very partial window and only seeing a partial part of the enterprises. And so no one really has a full picture of the whole. It's like, oh, we need to invest money in this thing. But it's like, well, in the whole, we can't because we have a bigger priority over here. And this thing brings us more money. And this thing is not working well this year, so we're not putting any money into it, actually. Or whatever it happens to be. But the gardens, I actually wanted to be in the gardens this year. We, we restructured how we do things, and it's not worked out how I envisage. So we're in an interesting process where we're going to restructure how things operate at the farm because it's all these enterprises we do are highly observational based. We have amazing people coming here but unless they already have that patterned inability to really observe what they're looking at and take it on as their own, it's, it's a lot to manage here. And that requires quite a bit of experience because don't you think that, like the thing that seems quite obvious to me is that animals are a living and breathing and moving creature yeah. whereas the vegetables don't move. That's the thing. So it seems like you can scale and delegate this kind of thing because it's it is a market garden. I mean, from my experience, it's quite simple compared to mm. some of these other enterprises. And that these this is more or less static in the sense that it's not going to change much from day one to day two. But the animals well, can experience predators, sure. can experience a disease. They can claw each other up. There's more happening there that require like your expertise is harder to get some of these people that are brand new, it's hard to pass your knowledge off as quickly as you might hear. There's a bit of that, but I think there's more going on than that too. And I think that the trouble, there's, there's a welfare issue when you have animals. Like right now with the roll of boiler pens, there's 25,000 euros of birds in there. It's a lot of birds in a small space. It's risky and though. It's, there's a high risk, but it's yeah. a risk I'm willing to take to look at innovative ways to adapt these models for better welfare and less work. But if someone is... I, so when people come here, I need to sit and learn about how they actually observe and work. Because people can say all kinds of things and have had all kinds of experiences, but I need to know from my experience what are they seeing, what are they missing. With a vegetable garden, I think it's a lower barrier to entry as it were it's like the, there is nothing moving and the worst that could happen is some plants get eaten or die mm -hmm. but we have a lot of plants but with the chickens yeah we have a lot of chickens but they are living breathing things that we've put in a net or a cage and now their welfare is above your own if you put an animal in captivity you've got to prioritize it above yourself and so we've been having this heat wave now where you know, I'm, I'm looking very closely, like these birds must have water at all times throughout the day. And so if someone is just following a routine I've set them, rather than thinking, wow, it's really hot today, I'd better go an extra time and check, then that can cause a severe loss of revenue in just like Really this. quickly, yeah. We had examples here where someone didn't open a nest box of the uh, Eggmobile, and that killed 50 birds who piled up behind the nest box like that. Now, that's not just 50 birds dying, which is a horrific thing to have to deal with in the morning before breakfast, but it's also 3,000 euros of eggs in their lay cycle. So you can't replace that in the middle of the season. Right. And likewise, we have shelters on our boiler pens for our predominant winds that we turn around tree lanes in a very specific pattern. And one day someone turned new birds around the opposite way and made a wind trap and we happened to have a storm and we lost, you know, thousands of euros of revenue that night. So those sort of things, 
take a little bit more observing and care than most of the processes that go on in the market garden. It's like you could screw up a bed, but that's fine. We can plant another bed. You can't replace 200 chickens that easily. So they do require more care and they are complex in their nature. Vegetables grow themselves. So once the seeds are in, as long as you water them, keep them happy, there's not too much that can go wrong in that way. And you've got, you know, 200 beds here that we can catch up any errors or mistakes in a way. Whereas with livestock, it does take a little more care and it certainly takes a little bit of experience to understand the physiology and psychology of an animal. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. But yeah, it's been unfortunate. I wanted to be in the gardens a lot this year and I have pretty much been in the gardens, not at all, so. So now I've got some questions for, from you guys that I'm gonna ask Richard. And I might have more here than we is really, like, are we gonna make this video an hour long? Probably not, so. Um, um, okay, uh, some of these I can skip. I'll, I'll, cut, I'll cut in here. Um, okay, some, here's a specific one from Steve Fairbarn. Uh, permaculture hops, or polyculture hops, and managing animals in them. Um, talk about... The, I guess they want to know, like, how are your the the hops doing? I saw them down there mm. by the well. Has the has the drought been kind of harsh on those? Yeah, the hops is a bit of a um, like we have a local brewer in our village who gives us all this spent grain, and he's given us massive amounts of pig food for free, basically. And he wanted us to test three types of hops that might be good for beer making here, and. It's Sweden used to grow a lot of hops and it, it grows none anymore so there's a big marketing point if you have local hops because it's the only thing that can't be produced here easily but to be honest they require a lot of work and in the beginning they were making a little plan for the revenue of it as it scaled up but I double checked it a year later and it's it's not profitable in any way that we could do it it needs to be done in a hop yard more intensively so I actually, as I get more focused in on being on the farm and doing less stuff around, I actually invited him to take the hops back and it's something that I, I kind of want to clear out the farm because I just don't have time to look after yeah. another thing. So I'm actually in the process of streamlining yeah. down a bit. Uh, so I'm not an expert on hops but I think you need to grow them quite intensively in a hop yard if you want to have any decent amount of yield. So okay so that I mean, that I brings another question. What are some things that you think you'd like to lean out in the operation going forward? I think I would, like one thing we've been doing, we're in also an education site trying to expose people to things. And it's that's very tiring and time consuming. And it's been amazing. But now as we have kind of implemented the farm, it's more about just managing the farm. So it's a different type of person that we can really help. Uh, one of our big aims here is to facilitate more people going out and start in farming, mm -hmm. which a high percentage of our participants and core team go off and do, which is really great. But I want to get rid of some of the trainings, I want to get rid of some of the things we do on the side for people's benefit, they're not really for our benefit. Like for example, we've had cows for milking and getting people used to handling big animals, but to keep cows over the winter here and feed them over the winter, it's a very expensive way to have milk. Right. So now we're moving on to breeding something more beef breed onto the cows and start selling grass-fed beef on a small scale but through the Rico rings that we sell uh, as Facebook managed selling groups connecting farmers to consumers you can sell an animal like that for 3,000 euros of net profit so suddenly having 10 cows a year to sell is, is a nice sideline enterprise which up till now has just been costing us money to expose people to handling animals. Mm -hmm. So we're getting rid of processes like that. We'll probably get rid of things like doing turkeys on the side and just focus in on the key enterprises. But longer term, we have a different plan because as we pay off debt now and move into a place where we don't have such high financial needs, we don't need to produce as much. So the enterprises we've been doing and the rate we've been scaling them is to cash flow and pay off the farm in five years which is not something you have to do. It's just something we set out to do. Well, because that, that might get you a better quality of life too. Yeah. By, yeah. by doing it. Because I mean, I, I've been quite impressed with the crew you have, which actually isn't really that big of a crew. 
It's an awesome crew. And it's an awesome crew because we have 45, well, how many people? We have 45 people in our workshop right now. That's a lot of people for this kind of workshop. And your crew are like helping with that as well as managing as the daily tasks. The so, yeah. I mean, props to the crew because it, it, it's pretty amazing. Here's an interesting question I thought, and she, this woman, um, uh, Renata asked three questions. I think I can really only ask one because I'd like to try a couple others, but she was asking, um, if a teacher wanted to like bring s young students, children, yep. to your farm, kids, um, what do you think would be the, uh, your, the, the, the enterprise that you're most enthusiastic to show kids about? Well, for me, I can't take any of these things apart. Like, right, I'm, right. I'm She's asking you to compartmentalize, and it's kind of hard to uh, do yeah. that. Yeah, I'm interested in the whole. Yeah. Like, I would mm. never move to Sweden and be a chicken farmer, or be a vegetable farmer. Right. Like, I'm interested in the whole, and what's going on here is quite special. And it's the integration of all these things that excites me, the diversity of things, and the learning about all the little ecosystem processes around me. And so that's what I'm actually really passionate about. And I think if a school group came here, I mean, kids are fascinated by animals and they're fascinated by vegetables. So I would want to show them all of it and yeah. how they work together. Yes. You can't grow vegetables without animal manures. That's right. And you can't have animals in, you know, we're growing up in a country here where the school kids think the milk tanker is coming to the farm to put milk in the cows. And we have kids that don't know what a you know a zucchini plant looks like so I'm very passionate about trying to get school groups and kids here and they, they have been coming here but I think they need to see the whole because yeah. kids understand whole systems still they just get bashed out at school mm -hmm. and the university into thinking in linear compartmentalized siloed ways and yeah yeah so come bring them and uh, I'll happily tour them around all day yeah that's, that's 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 a great answer. Um, okay, one more, real quick, really simple one, is my permaculture wants to know what you're feeding. What, what's the feed you're giving your broilers and layers? Is it whole grain pellets, mash, crumble? It's uh, we buy organic feeds, and it's from Land of Menon. It's a big feed company in Sweden, and we feed pellets. But with the broilers, we substitute, so we use, with broiler production, you have a high protein feed in the beginning, a medium feed, and then a finishing feed. And so we, because you're buying bulk feed for savings, a couple of little silos that cost us 500 euros saves us 5,000 a year in bulk savings. We decided to, because we only have two, we buy the start feed and then we've worked out a feed ration to mix it with straight grain from an organic grower lower and uh, locally. And that grain is a quarter of the price of the pellets. Hmm. And so we mix it up to 60% uh, grain and that saves us a lot of money. So we are able to feed a 4.5 kilo broiler which will dress out at 2 and 2.4. That's worth about 30 euros. It costs us four and a half euros to produce. But it's done very scientifically and we do restricted feed. So we feed the birds several times a day and get them hungry in between, which makes them forage better. I know a lot of pasture poultry producers are just giving their birds free access to food. And that doesn't allow them to forage and express that natural ability because they'll just sit and eat carbohydrates and high energy food. Right. And with the layers, we used to uh, substitute up to 15% grain and no more because as you start to save feed costs, you also lose egg production. So it's, that's the tipping point. It's In my experience, we've tried all kinds of feed ratios and we've worked out those numbers for you. And so we used an organic layer pellet. And you've got to be careful with these high production birds. They are finely tuned machines if you could handle me put in, in in that crude way and so they need feeding the right fuel as it were you can't get away with feeding them berries and seeds and bits of this and that they need proper feed or their production and performance and health will not be adequate all right now thanks for watching check out another video i did with richard right after this one if you click up in the top right of the screen you're going to see a link to this video that's sort of a continued conversation with him and i all right guys thanks for watching